directly contributed to the combat success and survival of the unit after Corporal Gregory's death. Corporal Gregory, you, and by the way, if they ended up with 30 dead NVA, over 30 dead NVA, that was a big force that attacked his unit. Corporal Gregory used whatever time was available to instruct his Marines and hone their professional skills. This aggressive opportunity tra- opportunity training was necessary because few units could conduct formal training in the combat zone. I talked about this on EF Online the other day. I absolutely learned more from informal training than I did from formal training during my time in the Navy. Without question, it's not even close. If you were to remove all the informal lessons I learned, I would be an idiot. Do you find that the formal training is like kind of sorts itself out to be more valuable early on? Explain. So like, you know how you have like basic training, Mm -hmm. right? That's where you learn like all the the formal protocols that where everyone has to essentially do the same thing under very similar circumstances. And then the informal training seems to, and I'm totally just thinking about jujitsu right now Mm -hmm. and at work, I guess, where when you get informal training, that's when you're trained up on all the basics. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like college in a way. You know, you have like all these prerequisites like, hey, you guys all got to know this, this, Mm -hmm. this, this and, and know it good. And then later on, then maybe we'll send you out to a specific company or whatever to learn kind of what they do. And then you can start to apply these things in specific situations. I think the example to use would be, let's say you went to some kind of a technical school, like being a doctor, being a mechanic, being a air conditioning repairman. Yeah. You're going to learn some technical stuff in the classroom. Yeah. But when do you really get good? It's doing the job. It's yeah. when some, it's when someone pulls you aside and says, "Oh yeah, when you see this, here's the problem." Right. When you when you when you go here, here's what you need to do. When you see this symptom from a patient, yeah. here's what's actually happening. It's all that informal training that, and maybe I'm wrong about the doctors because I don't know what medical school is like, but I can only imagine that you get a heck of a lot better by once you're in the field and you're doing surgeries. And yeah. someone says, "Hey, here's a better way to. Here's the technique you need yeah, to use there. Yeah. Here's, you know, something like that." Yeah, yeah. I was. Um, it's like you know how you. I think it was. A, it was a book you were reading a long time ago, where where they'd have a name. Shoot, it might have been. Might have been one of our guests. I don't know, but they'd have a name for the people who don't do. Yeah, I think it was in the army mm-hmm. where they don't do it. They just do all the theory, and they called them something like nerds or something. Pogues. Like that. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, there's the people who know, and they essentially they know what mm-hmm. to do and what the protocols are in a vacuum. Yeah. But once you start, when you get out out there in the field in the real world kind of thing, that's yep. where that informal like, no, this isn't by the book over here. Yep. You got to watch out for this because yep. of it, you know. And there's also a difference between just learning from experience, which is, hey, I did this operation. Here's some th- mistakes that I made, and all and. and that's just experience. Classroom is classroom. I'm talking about in between where you're, you know, someone's pulling you aside and say, hey, Jonko, when you start to see this develop, that's not a good call. Here's a call that would be better to make, and here's yeah. why. It's not formal training. Yeah. It's my platoon chief telling me something. Yeah. It's my LPO, my leading petty officer saying, hey, hey, new guy, here's what you need to do when you see that unfolding. And you go, okay, roger that. It's not formal training, but that's where you learn. Yeah. And it's not just experience either. Experience alone would take you way longer yeah, yeah, than true. informal training. Like how many times? Okay, jujitsu example. Mm-hmm. Here you learn the arm lock. Now we're rolling. Yeah. And you try and arm lock me, and I say, "Hey, Echo, if you if you don't squeeze your knees together, it's real easy to get out here. Put, give me your arm. Boom. Oh yeah, you feel that? Try and pull your arm out. Oh, I can't. Oh, okay, yeah. That's because yeah. all because I'm squeezing my knees. Okay. Yeah. Info. The, look, the instructor guarantee the instructor said squeeze your knees. Yeah. But you need that informal assessment of your actual situation to realize, oh, I, I, I see what I need to do. Yeah, exactly right. That's exactly what I was thinking too, the jiu What uh, was the, the you, I mean, you have to get informal training once you're in the, once you're done with the rag. Yeah. I, I think just how you described it, the, the, you talked about like being on site or being in the field or doing it like that. You talked about even just the air conditioner repairman and what that looks like. The way you described what life would be like if all we ever did was formal training, you'd have no context for anything. You wouldn't even know how it applies. So I, I think that's true in in certainly in my case in in aviation. I don't think it's any different. Like 
everything is taught by the book. Everything is formal training in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's all these things. And the minute you get in the airplane and get up in the sky and you are feeling things in, in a different way, it's really hard to apply them because you're, you learned it on the ground. And the context of the informal, hey, hey, listen, look, do you see that? Yeah, yeah. That's what it means in the book when it says this. That's what it looks like. And you go, oh, man, I would never be able to understand that from reading it in a book. They have to tran- you have to get a translation. Yeah, you a do. Little translation. You have, you have to be able to see and feel it. For the, and that will not happen in formal training. It's important to realize if you have some experience and you have people that are on your team, the amount of knowledge that you can transfer to them is so valuable. And, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because a lot of times you forget that, right? You think you've been doing this for a long time. You don't think it's a big deal. Hey, this is just what you do. You, don't, you, you, forget, you forget that you've learned all this. But taking that and saying, hey, 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 pal, come over here. Let me show you something. Let me show you how this works. Let me show you a better way to do that. Let me show you a, a little trick. It's very powerful, not to mention when you invest in people, like that for 10 minutes for 10 minutes you're helping them and you're building that relationship which is what this whole thing is that we're talking about yeah and i wrote down while you were talking that telling that story of of that corporal is i I just wrote down i I always take notes that's all i do in this podcast i just take notes i take these things home and i write them down and i keep them and i find places where they apply and as you know they apply everywhere and this this idea of this guy training his people is actually the best thing he can do to take care of them. It's the best thing he can do. It's the best thing any leader can do to help them. Not give you a break or not give you free time. And yeah, of course there's a balance there, but the best thing he could do is prepare them to be in a position. And I think the reason that stuck with me is that when we talk about decentralized command, which we talk about all the time in business, the scenario that always plays out is the reason why decentralized, one of the reasons why decentralized command is so important is that your people have to know what to do when you're not around. That's pretty obvious. But the scenarios are usually you're on vacation. (laughs) You're on a different shift. You've got the day off. Not that you're dead. So when you kind of think of it in these contexts of of what he was doing is being able to prepare them to be successful without him being around is in the worst possible situation. If if literally him dying in that situation is the best thing he can do. So so the same thing doesn't happen to them is train them. Mm. Even if it's five minutes at a time. Is that's how he kept those guys alive, and th- and that is something that you can you can translate to almost any situation. Yeah, your family. Yeah, we talk about this in the code, the protocol, the, the evaluation. It's like, hey, what can you do to your family? What, can you give your family five minutes of training to pass on knowledge that you have? <sighs> More lessons here. Corporal Gregory realized that combat is a dynamic environment which takes a heavy toll on leaders within an infantry company. He trained his subordinates to be able to assume his role. This saved the lives of his men during the chaos of battle. After his death, the men of Corporal Gregory's squad performed well, performed well because they had confidence in their training and in themselves, a confidence that was instilled by Corporal Gregory's leadership. You know, when we were talking, when we talk about confidence, how, how do you get confidence? You get confidence through work. You get confidence by doing something. You get confidence by doing something, not doing it well, doing it again, doing it a little bit better, doing it again, doing it even better. That's where confidence comes from. That's where it should come from. Otherwise, it's false confidence. Maybe I should just stop talking because the way he that was written in the book was a lot better than the way I said it. But <laughs> well, here's what's really cool. So they have a if we he mentions he mentions uh, uh, Kirby in this PFC Kirby, a member of the of Corporal Gregory's squad that finished this uh, NCO MCI in the field. Well, I have a quote from him, not from Vietnam, but from 1998. And now Sergeant Major R. B. Kirby said. The very worst night of my tour in Vietnam, when we were involved in a major firefight and we were losing Marines, our squad survived as a result of the corporal's training. We are alive today because of him. Next one. Corporal Abals, British Army. Falklands, 1982. In 1982, Argentina invaded the Falklands, Falkland Islands in the South Pacific, South Atlantic Ocean. 
The islands had been British territory since British days as, as an imperial power, not willing to give up its territory. Britain sent a task force to the islands in order to reclaim them. After an amphibious assault, British forces pushed their way across the islands. The second battalion of the parachute regiment, known as Two Para of the British Army, was ordered to attack the Argentinian forces of Goose Green. It was to be the first pitched battle between British and Argentinian forces. The land bridge between Goose Green and the town of Darwin was the only way for forces to move between East Falkland Island and Lafonia Island. If Tupera could not break through to Goose Green, the British would have to spend valuable time mounting another amphibious assault of the Falkland Islands. Corporal Abals was a section leader equivalent to a squad leader in A Company Tupera. A Company's mission was to attack along the battalion's eastern flank and assault the town of Darwin. On the night of 27 May 1982, Tupera attacked Goose Green. The Argentinians were well prepared for the attack and the paratroopers could advance only yards at a time. As the sun rose, the battalion was left in a precarious position. Tupera was stalled, pinned down in the open by Argentinian mortar and machine gun fire. A company was trapped in a crossfire between the Argentinians on Goose Green and those in Darwin. This is a nightmare scenario. You're you're in a crossfire receiving both mortar and machine gun fire. Realizing that the trap could only be broken by persistent aggressive action, Corporal Abals decided to continue to lead his squad in assaulting enemy positions, seeking to break the deadlock himself, the commanding officer of Tupera, charged a machine gun nest and was shot dead. The commander of A Company kept the event quiet, not wanting to demoralize the troops, whose predicament seemed to worsen at this critical point in the attack. At that moment, Corporal Abals led an assault upon an Argentinian position. He decided to fire a 66mm shoulder-launched anti-tank rocket into the bunker. The penetration of this rocket caused such a magnificent explosion, which was followed by silence. The first flags of surrender then began to surface from the Argentinian positions. The Argentinians had been demoralized by the utter destruction of this single bunker and the ruthlessness of Corporal Abal's resolve. This allowed A Company to turn its full attention toward Goose Green. Momentum gathered behind the British attack. In the next 24 hours, two para opened the route to Lafonia Island. Corporal Abal's persistent aggressiveness had broken the will of the defenders. This action proved to be pivotal, pivotal in A Company's attack. Two, para, two Para's victory at Goose Green assured a British victory for the Falkland campaign. Lessons. Corporal Abal's squad-level action effectively turned the tide of the battle at Goose Green. This is ex- This is an example of how an aggressive tactical action can have effects out of all proportion to the size of the action. His command decisions fully supported both his company and battalion commander's intent. His spectacular assault of that particular bunker affected the morale of both sides, crushed the spirit of the Argentinians, and passed the initiative and momentum to British forces and proved to be the action needed to continue the British advance. After this action, Argentinian soldiers began to surrender rather than die in combat. One person, a corporal, makes one move, and it changes the, 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 the tide of this battle. By the way, moments after his commanding officer was killed, heroically assaulting a machine gun nest. Corporal Abal's courage, leadership, and determination propelled him to persevere and achieve Decisive results in extricating his unit from a desperate situation. When all else fails, perseverance prevails. And if you want more on the Falkland Islands, Podcast 88, Excursion to Hell. Sergeant David C. Freeman, U.S. Army, Vietnam, 1966. During Operation Crazy Horse, and pay attention to that name, Operation Crazy Horse. We're going to go deep. In the Vinh Thanh Valley 
in June of 1966, a company of Montagnard troops led by Special Forces advisors landed at LZ Monkey for a search and destroy mission. Sergeant Freeman, a member of the command element, was the fourth senior man in the unit. Soon after landing, the company attacked and secured a bunker complex. The company suffered some casualties and a helicopter medevac was requested. The company moved back to LZ Monkey with their wounded. 